We are on our second to last session of the day. Hopefully you've enjoyed the sessions up to now and the, the keynote and, and all throughout the morning and, and afternoon, at least morning and afternoon here in the US and afternoon into the evening in Europe. So uh, this next session is going to be simplifying containers and Kubernetes on your laptop with Podman desktop with Stefan and Cedric will be presenting. So I'll turn it over to you guys and I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, cool, cool, cool. Thank you all for being here. Today has been super exciting uh, with all the sessions that we've had, uh, the great speakers talking about AI, ML, OpenShift, Kubernetes. And, you know, at the core of everything, right, is the, the basic fundamental uh, of container technology. And that's what me and Stevan uh, are here to do uh, today is to kind of talk about Podman, to talk about the newest tool, the newest development that is Podman Desktop that um, that Stevan has uh, the pleasure of working on. Uh, and we kind of want to address uh, this whole journey of simplifying containers and Kubernetes on your laptop with Podman Desktop and kind of go through the process of, of going from, uh, you know, a Docker file to an image to a container and then taking that container and actually putting that uh, and deploying that onto Kubernetes. So we're going to kind of show that flow uh, and we're going to break up this presentation half into talking a little bit about Podman, which I'm sure you already know about. Uh, and then we'll be talking about Podman desktop and uh, delivering a demo. So happy to have you here. Please um, feel free to drop where you're connecting from. Uh, you know, myself, uh, I'm out here in lovely California. Stevan, what about you? I'm uh, in not in France, so in Europe. Nice, a little cold over there, I bet. Um, but yeah, feel free yeah. To, to to let us know where you're from, and then we'll go ahead and start up this presentation here uh, in in just a second. But um, yeah, just waiting for everyone to uh, to get in here. So, um, and before we even begin, uh, I'll introduce myself real quick. My name is Cedric Clyburn, I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. I cover all things developer tools like Podman, of course, but also Tecton, Odo, Argo CD um as well as openshift of course and i also work on some of the labs so we've got uh labs on podman that you can find at developers.redhat.com learn uh, as well as other technologies for container fundamentals and more for openshift um and um yeah happy to be here uh, stevan uh how about you yeah yeah thanks for uh, for for having us uh, today and very happy to be uh, to be here today to speak about uh, Podman and Podman Desktop. I'm product manager. I'm working uh, on various developer tools and I'm focused primarily on Podman Desktop at the moment. So happy to be here and join the, the cool party of Dev Nation today. Exactly. And you couldn't get a better lineup for this presentation. Uh, Stevan is the PM, of course, for Podman Desktop. So. If anyone knows, uh, you, you know more about it, you know, it's him. So uh, let's go ahead and kind of dive into what you all are here for to talk about Podman and Podman Desktop. So firstly, uh, you know, what's Podman? I'm sure you already are pretty familiar with the project. Uh, and that's the most basic question. But before I want to get to what it is and the technology and some of the architecture, uh, I want to introduce some of the fun mascots that you've probably seen before if you've worked with Podman um and kind of give a little bit of background on the project so podman it's a really really cool and neat tool for working with containers as we hear see here on the uh the bottom left or the bottom right sorry um but it's for working with one or more containers uh and and pods and kubernetes concepts um so a group of seals as we see here we've got these three guys uh are called a pod and this brings into um the conversation the name podman right what, what does that mean well uh you know pod manager so managing multiple pods mo managing multiple containers images volumes networks whatever it might be and so there's these cool cute graphics that you're going to see throughout this presentation uh and of course since this is a dev nation day we had to give them some cool fedoras um and some swag so uh you know they're looking pretty fly right now uh, but enough about that. Let's kind of talk about Podman. And Kevin, I do want to address your question. Uh, well, we can share this presentation uh, with you so you can have all the contents um, and also share with you the demo uh, resources if you'd like to check it out as well. Um, but I also want to ask before we dive into Podman, 
um, to kind of learn more about uh, you guys and and where you are at with containerization technology. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to know, are you a beginner? Maybe you're just getting started. You're familiar with Docker files. You can build images or uh, maybe you're intermediate. You know, you're working with uh, debugging containers. You're working a little bit with selecting the right base image for, for your images. Or are you an expert? You know, you're working with uh, advanced container security. Uh, you're working with the multi-tenancy. Uh, you're working with uh, deployment of these containers into production, uh, maybe on RHEL or something like that. Please let us know. Uh, in the chat, so we can kind of, um, you know, tailor this talk more towards your specific interest. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll give it just a second here. But, you know, are you a beginner, expert, uh, or intermediate in the middle? Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue on from there and kind of try to tailor this presentation uh, in that aspect. So we'll give it a second. And then, I mean, um, we t definitely get a, a variety of, of different audiences when we when we do this presentation. So it's it's always good to know. Um, but a as that comes in, um, you know, we'll also be talking about Kubernetes. So whether you're a beginner with Kubernetes or you know more advanced with working with different resources, pods, deployment services, ingresses, um, we'll try to cover that as well when we actually get to the deployment. Um, on the Kubernetes, but um, let's go ahead and uh, and start in talking just a bit about what Podman is. So Podman is uh, at its core a CLI tool, open source that manages uh, container resources. So everything from the, uh, the images uh, to you know containers that are running processes of an image to uh, pods, um, working with these Kubernetes concepts uh, to volumes to networks. Uh, and, and more. So it's supported by Red Hat. Uh, and uh, it, first off, it is pretty lightweight. So there's no background daemon uh, running these containers. What's happening is Podman is forking itself, and that process is then uh, becoming the container. So it's very small, very portable. Uh, we see Podman used in a variety of settings from, um, from on-prem to machines to the you know, edge deployments where uh, you know, we can take advantage of some Podman uh, capabilities like uh, auto rollbacks and auto updates, which we'll talk about as well. Um, because of this daemonless architecture, it's also rootless. So Podman uh, is able to reduce the attack surface uh, of, um, of security threats onto your system. Uh, you can build custom SE Linux policies. Uh, you can support SecComp profiles. Uh, you can leverage all these cool Linux kernel benefits for security. Um, and a big thing is the multi-tenancy for enterprises that can't give their developers, you know, root access to do uh, some of, uh, you know, Docker's functionalities. You know, they can do everything within their user namespace. And so Podman has a huge advantage when it comes to security. And if, if you come away with anything from this presentation is that Podman is hardened by default, right? Um, on the bottom left here, you know, Podman is very open source first. It's from Red Hat. Uh, you know, we're, we do everything in this open source fashion and culture. Uh, you know, it's no lock in. Uh, and Podman Desktop is really cool because it supports even Docker or Colima as an engine. So it's really flexible for developers who, uh, you know, need to either bounce between both uh, and, and use these tools as they want. Um, and it's also compatible. So based on the OCI, the Open Container Initiative um, back in 2015, um, you know, all the commands that you're doing in Docker for a Docker run, Docker push, Docker pull uh, are pretty much the same when it comes to Podman. It was kind of designed as a drop in replacement. Uh, so all your familiarity as well as Docker Compose support comes with Podman. Uh, so it's, it's very cool because of this uh, standardization that it's occurred. Um, and I'll kind of demonstrate that Podman runs on any operating system here as I'm on Mac uh, here in a second. But what happens uh, when we're using Podman is it's setting up a Podman VM that uses Fedora to allow us to do all of our container actions, right? So this includes the the pulling, the building, and the pushing of our images. You know, the mounting of volumes, uh, debugging our containers, pushing images to registries, uh, and also working with Kubernetes. So different Kubernetes resources like deployments uh, and pods, and being able to say create a pod within uh, Podman and then export those Kubernetes manifests to be deployed onto a cluster. So 
uh, there's a lot that you can do. Um, and I just want to check out the chat here. We've got some uh, intermediate, beginner to immediate. We want to learn more about containerized databases. Fantastic. The demo is going to include a containerized version of Redis running in our two-tier application. So can't wait to show you that. Um, a little bit about images. You know, these are the, just these uh, essentially, you know, uh, 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 sorry, just Docker files that, uh, you know, allow you to layer on uh, your application from a base image, whether it's, uh, you know, Apache or or any other kind of uh, foundation, and then layer on what you need, your code base, your um, different variables, parameters, and then build that image to be ran as a container. So the container is just this running instance of an image uh, sharing the OS kernel. So it's able to start up extremely fast compared to a VM. And it's ephemeral, so we you know, close out our container, we remove it, uh, and the data is gone. So this is a very, very cool concept for uh, scalability, uh, being able to quickly bring up resources and, and scale them down as well. And then pods. So pods is a concept that we'll be taking a look at today with Podman Desktop, uh, which is you know, a group of one or more containers that share the same storage and network. Uh, they can talk to each other on localhost, uh, and you can do commands such as podman pod create to create one, uh, generate the Kubernetes manifest, or you could take a Kubernetes manifest for a pod that you already have and uh, play it directly on podman. So it's pretty cool. But I do want to back up just for a second, just because, you know, it's kind of important to uh, explain how we got here and a little bit of the history of podman. So Red Hat in general, when it comes to containers, we've got this unique perspective where uh, we kind of realize that there's no one size fits all solution, right? We need a Swiss army knife to be able to approach all the problems that we have with, um, with containerization technology and, and provide these different solutions uh, in these kind of modular tools. So uh, all the tools that we, we cover today, Podman, Podman Desktop, and we'll kind of introduce some of the others, have open standards, there's open development, um, you know, Stevan's community on GitHub for Podman Desktop, you know, you can create a PR, you can, you know, create an issue, you can talk to the developers. It's very open, uh, the communication there, which is pretty cool because it leads to more innovation, uh, more interoperability, um, and a better workflow in general when it comes to this. Uh, so you've got Podman and Podman Desktop. Uh, thanks, Devon, for dropping that link in there. That's where you can learn more about these different tools. Uh, but you've also got Builder. So say you're in a uh, maybe a CI situation you're using Tecton where you want to build uh, an OCI image. Well, you can use Builder for that, which is pretty cool. You could also use tools like Scopio to say I have an image on Docker Hub and I need to pull it down to a different uh, you know, private registry. I can do that there without even having to download it to my local machine and then push it again. Or CRUN, which is um, a OCI runtime. Uh, the performance benefits there are pretty impressive uh, if you want to check that out there. But all of these are linked, uh, and we'll drop the slides for the, the link for the presentation here as well, so you can check out these slides. Um, but go back quickly to the Podman 101s. Um, you know, the most important things I want to emphasize are these secure rootless containers uh, that are mapped on the user's namespace, uh, which is pretty cool, reducing that attack vector. Uh, there's no daemon process because of this fork exec model. Um, there's the Kubernetes support uh, because Podman actually came from uh, Creo, which Creo, if you haven't heard of it before, is a Kubernetes container runtime. Um, and so when we were developing um, Creo, uh, we kind of, uh, this kind of came from it, Podman, what it is today. Um, and since day one, you know, Podman is kind of focused on this rootless support uh, and being container hardened, uh, sorry, security hardened. Uh, and then it's platform compatible. So I'm running Windows today, but if you're running Windows, I'm running Mac today, but if you're running Windows, or of course, containers are Linux, so natively on Linux, uh, you can use Podman uh, wherever you are. But you're probably wondering yourself, you know, I've been using Docker before, what's the differences between uh, Podman and Docker? And we get this question quite a bit, uh, and it really comes down to these container engine differences when it comes to architecture. Um, so here we've got Podman on the top, and Podman is kind of implementing what's known as a fork exec model. Um, so containers run simply as child processes from the initial Podman CLI commands that you're typing in. So there's no daemon. Um, there's a container monitor here in the middle that's known as conmon, uh, which starts before each container and it stops after, and it's just for monitoring metrics, things like that. 
And there's a system D integration that's going on in the background for all of this. Um, so there's no daemon process going on. So these containers, they're just running as pod uh, processes. You can even upgrade Podman, and it's not going to interrupt some of your containers that are already running, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the differences between this and Docker are Docker's commands are kind of communicating through what's known as this client server architecture. So the Docker client, either it's Docker desktop or Docker CLI, you're doing your commands um, from a rootless perspective. But then historically, due to kernel uh, requirements, uh, you know, there were these security implications for running the Docker daemon as root. So maybe if a container broke out, you know, it could run as root and that's a big security implication. It's difficult to restrict that. Um, you could mount Docker daemon access in containers uh, for volumes and, and get full system access. And it was kind of uh, much more challenging uh, to, to run it in this, in this root fashion. And you can run Docker uh, in a rootless fashion. You lose a little bit of functionality, but I feel like it's <clears throat> important to know that. But Podman, it's, you know, big advantage is it runs rootless by default. Uh, and there's other differences. If you check out this uh, video on IBM Technologies channel, there's a really cool guy who made a uh, That's a uh, cool video. video. <laughs> Thank it's you, a cool Stavon. one. <laughs> <laughs> it is a cool one um, about the differences. Um, and so definitely recommend to check it out uh, <clears throat> if you want to learn a bit, little bit more. And then I'll kind of finish up talking about Podman when it comes to deployments and production, right? So we know the Podman, it's very lightweight, it's standalone, um, and it's perfect whether you're a developer or if you're trying to put your containers into production. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about this new tool called Quadlet, which actually allows you to do declarative Podman container deployment, um, pretty similar to, say, Docker Compose or to Kubernetes Manifest, um, but natively for Podman. Uh, so you can generate these system D these unit files that we see right here uh, to kind of specify what image, what volumes, any other parameters, uh, and, and run that all through systemd, which is pretty cool. Um, you could also take advantage of things like uh, if we're working with Podman in the edge, uh, auto updates and rollbacks um, while you know keeping high availability for our containers. But that kind of wraps up, and <laughs> sorry I had to speed through it, but the intro to containers and Kubernetes and and kind of how Podman, as at its core, as a CLI, you know, focuses on facilitating both of those. Now, I want to hand it off to Stevan to kind of talk about the next step, right? You know, working on these container workflows and and moving to Kubernetes. So, Stevan, thank you, you. Cedric. Thank you very much. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, we've been discussing exhaustively about uh, Podman. And uh, so you understood that it is a container engine for, uh, for managing and running OCI containers on, uh, on your environment. But with Podman desktop, we are trying to make running containers and working with Kubernetes easier for the developers. And in fact, from its inception, Podman was designed with a keen awareness of uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem and its prevalent role in the, the container orchestration landscape. So in fact, even the name of Podman Desktop is derived from, uh, from, uh, from Pod Manager. Uh, so in this context, Pod uh, refers to the concept of Pods in, uh, in Kubernetes. So um, <laughs> as a result, you will see that uh, what we try to establish is really uh, making Podman uh, and Podman Desktop a fairly practical platform for developing and testing Kubernetes application and applications and, uh, and bridging the, the gap between local developer environments and large-scale Kubernetes deployment. And there's reasons for that. In fact, uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, developer environments have become both impractical and the lack of consistency with production environments. In fact, when there are a lot of complicated setup to get uh, a local developer environment up and running, and your laptop naturally has limited resources compared to your production environment as well. It lacks of consistency also because the way you are going to run things on your local environment are unlikely to be the way you run them on a live environment, especially if you are targeting to run uh, that onto Kubernetes or, or OpenShift. In fact, there's 
a lot more pieces at work in a production environment that are very difficult to reproduce on a developer environment. So there's discrepancies in the way uh, containers are getting created, but also in the way we are creating composite applications. Uh, in the way each of the containers are going to communicate between uh, between each other. And in fact, we all fight <laughs> configuring a network between multiple services. So to solve this, we end up uh, using tools, uh, different tools to group application together. But in fact, those tools are bringing you uh, in, a, in a dead end in the worst of the booth world where you need to then translate your application to be able to run it onto a, onto a production environment. So when you are targeting to deploy your application onto Kubernetes, as a developer, you are exposed to an additional complexity and an additional overhead. Uh, and, uh, and there's also a, a challenge with the, the skills uh, as well. And in fact, if you, if you take the tools and the different solutions that are used in your local developer environment. You may be pulling images that are coming from different sources, which will have low to no security constraints and different, uh, dif different ways to, to, to create your composite application. Maybe you will be using uh, Docker Compose. But then when you want to go to the other side of the spectrum to production, in fact, you are asked to use a different set of base images, you need to use Quay maybe, or you need your images to be rootless. And then you have to under Kubernetes YAMLs because that's the way you are going to package your application to run them onto, onto production. So there is a gap from to move from local to production. And then there is another challenge, which is how do I reproduce an issue which is happening on production into my local environment. So all of this is creating an, ad, uh, an adoption barrier of Kubernetes technologies. Uh, and uh, it's complicated to reconcile developer environments with the target uh, production environment constraints. And in, in fact, oftenly, we can hear the ops are, uh, are getting burdened by having to convert the developer artifacts to run them onto production. So that's that's really a, a challenge. So for us, uh, on the next slide, what we are trying to do with Podman Desktop is really providing a simplistic onboarding. As you, Cedric mentioned, with Podman, you can build containers, you can run them locally, and then you can run pods uh, as well. So you can create your uh, objects that are going to be the, the deployment unit of your application and run them locally exactly the same way than what you would do if you were going to target a Kubernetes uh, environment. So uh, it's a perfect solution, in fact, to bring simplicity into and a pathway for, for the developer to get start with uh, Kubernetes objects and with the paradigms of, uh, of Kubernetes. And then, with Podman Desktop, you can also go one step further. You can then lean toward a Kubernetes environment that you can spin up locally on your uh, develop developer environment. In fact, from Podman Desktop, you will have the ability to spin up a kind environment. So for those who are not aware, kind is Kubernetes running inside of containers, or you also could use a Minikube as well. So, and you can connect to, to different Kubernetes uh, environments uh, as well. So that's really what we are aiming to do with Podman Desktop, helping the developers uh, into bridging the gap between what you are doing locally and the way you are going to run your application onto production and providing you a simplistic way to move from an application to containers and then to Kubernetes objects, pods, services, deployments, and then test that into a Kubernetes environment. But I guess that's the demo from Cedric. <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess it is. Maybe we should show everything that we've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> all the way, yeah, as, as Stevan mentioned, from 
the beginning uh, to, you know, actually deploying onto a Kubernetes cluster um, through the help of his fantastic tool and teams, uh, fantastic tool, Podman Desktop. So um, this is great timing because it looks like we're about 25 minutes in. We didn't want to do too much presentation. So let's go ahead and ho hop over to my local development environment to show you all of this behind the scenes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hop out of here to uh, my desktop where I can see, you know, a project that I'm working on and the project that we're actually going to be uh, using with Podman Desktop here on the right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open up Podman Desktop here full screen so you can see everything. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, and here we are. So this is Podman Desktop. If you haven't seen it before, um, as you can see, uh, we got a uh, kind of intuitive interface where we can manage our containers, our pods, images, volumes. Uh, we can use extensions as well. Um, and we also have some other features like the kube config here uh, on the bottom left where we can select Kubernetes con context that we're working with that are loaded in <clears throat> from your local machine. Uh, we can ensure uh, Docker socket compatibility. So maybe we're using uh, extensions on VS Code that are tapping into the Docker socket. We can do that there. We can automatically update Podman as a container engine on our system, uh, which is pretty neat. And we've got some more uh, troubleshooting and tasks so we can see what's going on in the background when we're using Podman Desktop. Um, I also want to show you that you can you see the resources that Podman Desktop is using. Uh, of course, I told you before that we're using a, a Fedora VM that's running on our system that's able to manage these containers. Uh, we can you know specify all of that here. We can also create a new kind cluster, which we're actually going to do a little bit later, uh, which is kind of uh, signifying uh, Kubernetes and Docker, or of course here using uh, Podman as a provider, but you can select that. Uh, we can connect to the developer sandbox. You know, this is the DevNation family here that we're a part of. So, uh, you know, we could use the developer sandbox that you can access uh, on developers.red app. Uh, and uh, compose support, which is uh, um, a new uh, effort that, you know, Stevan's team has been doing for um, com supporting compose files in Podman, and we'll also take a look at that a little bit later. Uh, if we're a little bit in a you know hardened environment, we can set up a proxy, we can set up a custom registry, or use some of these uh, default providers, authentication, uh, use extensions that we already have here, such as Compose, Docker, Lima, Podman, Sandbox, or Maybe we have an extension that we are already using with Docker Desktop, and we can just import that here because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're all based on this OCI compliance, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then other settings here that we won't take too much of a look at because it's time to go from the beginning uh, of, of our example. So we've got essentially this really cool Python application. And, you know, this Python application, what it... What it serves to do is just work as a kind of guest book where we can refresh the page and see how many times the page has been visited, uh, which is pretty neat. And we're going to be storing that inside of a Redis database for cache. Um, so we just have a hit counter here. Uh, and so every time that the counter has been hit, we're going to update the Redis database cache. And as you can see, we can um, connect to it here uh, with, uh, with uh, Redis on port. Uh, 6379. Uh, so we're going to set up both this container, this application in a container, and also the database uh, inside of a container as well. Um, now, I, if I wanted to kind of go ahead and uh, start the application here, we, we could do it with, you know, with Flask, but uh, we're not running a database either on my local machine. Maybe I'm a new developer to the project and I just started, uh, you know, setting up my local environment. And that's kind of where the fundamental concept of container comes, containers come into, you know, being able to quickly um, set up a database or get this container, uh, you know, application running on my machine that someone else has passed over to me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this here. This is just uh, some old containers that we had running, uh, an old pod. Uh, we could either delete this or prune any containers that we're not using, which is pretty cool. And we've got this fresh blank state. Uh, and so what I'm going to go ahead and do. Um, is build this image. So we've got the Docker file here. Uh, we're starting from uh, the UBI, which is universal base image for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So we have all those security hardened features, compliance governance uh, for um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux on this Python container, which has all the libraries and runtimes that we need for this Python app. We're copying in 
Um, the code, uh, we're creating a new code work directory, sorry. We're putting in some um, environment variables, copying in the requirements.txt, just Flask and Redis, nothing too crazy. And we're setting up an entry point. And so this entry point is essentially going to look for the host file uh, for Redis uh, and then import or export, sorry, an environment variable for this app host so that Python, uh, that this Python app can connect to it. So all in all, this is just our Flask application. Let's go ahead and build it from Podman Desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and select um, the, uh, the folder that we're working with. So we've got this Podman Desktop demo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call in the Docker file here or a container file, which one you want to use. Uh, and I'm going to give it a name, Python app. So um, I'll, I'll call it Cedric Python app. So uh, what we're going to go ahead and do is pull down um, this base image, uh, copy it down to our machine, and it's going to uh, create all the layers that we need. So um, everything we talked about here, exposing ports um, and, uh, and making sure that uh, this application, when we run it, can start up uh, and start the century point to start this Flask server. And I'll show it really quick as this is downloading the base image. Um, if I go ahead and open up ooh, uh, terminal, if we do a Flask run, uh, well, let me CD into here. Um, primary pod is this got? Okay, CD front end. All right, cool. If we do a Flask run, uh, you'll see that we can start up this uh, server locally, but you're going to notice internal server error. We can't connect to uh, this Redis database. Um, so what we're going to do is we're also going to run that database containerized as well. And so while that's still pulling down the base image, I'll show you that we've also pulled down um, this Redis containerized database image. So I'll go here. Um, Quay.io slash CentOS. Oh, that's MongoDB, but we'll do Redis 5 CentOS 7 um, to show that we're also using this Redis database that we're going to, uh, we've already pulled down the image and we're just going to uh, run that as a container. So, um, and it looks like actually I already have a Python app that I've built from the Docker file just because it takes a little bit of time. What we're going to go ahead and do is since we can use this uh, image that's already been built, uh, we can see that uh, some of the same uh, instructions are already here, such as the environment variables for this Flask app, um, such as creating the work directory. So I'm going to go ahead and um, use some of the tools in Podman Desktop, such as being able to rename this image. So I'm actually want to specify it for my container registry. So that's going to be Pyburn Python app. So then if I change the name of this image just from Podman Desktop, we'll see now it's quay.io slash C Clyburn slash Python app. I could directly push this you know, to my registry, share it with others, so they could pull this down and run this same containerized application. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is to start up the database, actually, uh, so that we can pull in the host name for this and have this Python app connect to it so we don't have this error here that we have on the left side. So I'll go ahead and stop that application. Um, we can go ahead and start this container. So we've got this nice screen here where we can see uh, a variety of different options, such as uh, the container name, entry point, command, volumes. Uh, you know, As a database, we want to be able to per persist our, dat our data um, so we could specify a certain volume so that even if we stop this container, we remove it, You know, we could start it back up with the same um, data on the uh, database. But uh, I won't uh, work with any of that, but I'll show you any of the other settings here that we can also work with. And let's go ahead and start this container. So uh, this is just Redis here. Uh, so we've already got it running. Um, we can see any of the logs, the Kubernetes YAML. Uh, so if we wanted to uh, you know, directly just copy paste this and drop this into a Kubernetes cluster, we could do that. Uh, and we could also, oh, well, it looks like we have a segmentation fault. Let me see um what that might be from uh we could <laughs> we could also do any kind of redis cli commands in here as well i might need to restart this here in a second um one second y'all 
Uh, Quinn I have Centos, Centos 7. All right. One second. Let me try to re I'm gonna rerun that. Um, all right. Processing. There's password. Okay. All right. Um, I also want to show when we were taking a look at the inspection that we can take a look at some of the metadata uh, that this container provides, right? And so we could do this from Podman's, you know, CLI. We could inspect some of the met metadata, uh, do a Podman inspect the name of the container, uh, and then query for some of this. We could do a grep, or we could just do a, you know, uh, control F, uh, look for the IP address. Here we have it. Um, and we're going to use this uh, to connect our uh, Python container to this Redis database container that we also have running. So now we just have the Redis container. I'm going to go to this Python app that we uh, renamed here. I'm going to also start this, call it Python app. We can see that already specify the entry point directly from our Docker file. Um, we won't do any volumes, uh, but we will set up uh, an extra host to append to the host file. So we're going to call this Redis. We're going to put in this IP address. Uh, and now we've got both of these containers running, right? We've got the Python app, uh, and we've also got the Redis container. Um, and so we can try to go back in here. Still got a segmentation fault. I'm not sure why. But um, if we try to use the terminal, connection refused. Stevan, I'm not sure if you know what might be going on here. Um, we'll see if we can still access it from the Python container. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I can probably run it if you, if you need. OK. We'll see. We'll give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. Um, Python app um, has in its you know host file within that ephemeral container now, it has the, uh, the IP address of this Redis container. Fingers crossed to the demo gods for this one. Um, so we'll see, if, uh, we'll see if we can open up here uh, through this little icon, the external route um, for this Python application and see if it'll uh, run. One second. Through. Um, and yeah, I might have to have you um, <laughs> show this part of the demo because I'm having a little issue with, with Redis here. Not connecting. One second. Um, Something up with this container image. If you already have it ready, uh, we can try. This is the fun debugging part that you guys get to see. Uh, maybe I could import a different version of Redis and we could do this uh, really quickly. Up to you, Stevan. Just, <clears throat> I'm just clicking a few things and I will be ready if you, if you want. But otherwise, you can just uh, maybe. Uh, clean your two two containers yeah i'm gonna try just just the uh the vanilla redis real quick from docker hub uh and, and see if we can do that really quickly but if not no worries this is yeah the fun part about uh maintaining you know the versions of containers and everything so we'll see i'll pull this really quickly we'll try to run it again um, let's give it a shot. Okay, so I'm going to stop this um, Python application in order to restart this Redis container. So I'll go over here. We've got Docker IO slash Redis, the vanilla one. Um, we'll go ahead and start the container. Fantastic. This looks a lot better, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here, pull the IP address. Um, for connecting from back here, this Python application. So we'll try it again, Python app. Um, we'll add in the Redis host name, start this container. Thank you, Ismet. I appreciate it. Uh, fingers crossed, guys, DevNation family, that now we'll open up the external link. And fantastic. So a little bit of real world live action debugging here that you guys get to see. Um, it looks like well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, looks like we've got this connection into the container. You know, this Python app has the uh, host name for um, the uh, Redis container that we have. We can see the logs um, just as we would when we were working on it in our local IDE. 
Uh, but now in a containerized uh, world, you know, now we can share this with other developers that we're working with within our organization. We can see Redis, um, you can check out the uh, terminal here. Now, if we do Redis CLI, bam, we can, you know, do uh, any kind of Redis commands. Hello, hey, dev nation, and do git, hello. Cool, so everything's working how it should be. We've got the containerized database. Uh, it's completely ephemeral just for the demo. Uh, but now we also have the, uh, the, the application running here. Um, but this, this is fairly simple, right? Because we've got these two containerized applications. Um, and I think what we should do now is um, streamline this workflow and get these applications running onto Kubernetes. So we've got this fantastic ability here um, that you can see in Podman Desktop, where if we select multiple containers at the same time, what we can do is podify this. So create a pod with two selected items or whatever it might be. Um, and so we'll go ahead and select this. We'll do uh, dev nation pod. Um, we could select which ports we uh, need to be exposed. Though, so obviously not the, uh, the Redis one. Um, and we can go ahead and create this pod. So what it's going to be doing is uh, we, we call it podifying, uh, but it's going to be stopping these running containers and restarting them with all of their settings uh, in a pod that's running on the Podman engine. So here we go. It's been running for just a couple seconds here. Um, but you'll see we have the uh, the logs from both of the containers. We've got this Redis logs and we've got the Python app logs running now, um, you know, inter, inter, interlaced uh, in the same kind of unit. Um, and we could take this and run it on Kubernetes, which is pretty cool. So we've got the infra pod and the uh, two containers. Um, we've got the Kubernetes manifest, so I could drop this into my cluster, uh, and it would run both of these containers, which is pretty cool. Uh, and we can also, um, I'll go back to the application on what localhost 501. Cool. Yeah. You can see now if I bring this over here, um, you know, still run everything. Um, but now, um, you'll notice that the containers aren't running anymore. It's just the pod, which is pretty neat. Um, and this is pretty cool, right? But we're running this specifically on Podman as an engine, right? Um, I, let's let's say I need to start testing other things. I need to test services and load balancing and, and making sure that everything is connected, right? Kind of solving the issues uh, of, of working with a tool like Docker Compose, where we're kind of blocked to going to Kubernetes and actually going directly to Kubernetes. Uh, this is where I want to introduce you to our good friend, Kind. So Kind allows us to create very quickly a Kubernetes cluster uh, within a container um, that we can then do um, all of our commands with. Uh, so we can use kubectl um, to make these changes to test out things. And <clears throat> pretty similar to Docker, uh, to Minikube, uh, you know, it creates this local environment. You can see that we're pulling down uh, this version of Kubernetes, so 1.27.3. Uh, we're preparing the nodes, installing the control plane, and bam, just like that, we've created um, this running uh, Kubernetes cluster within uh, um, Podman, which is or Podman Desktop, which is pretty neat. So you know, we do kubectl uh, get pods. Of course, there's going to be nothing, nothing there at the moment. Uh, but if we go back down to our pods, we click on this one specifically. Uh, we can do a deploy to Kubernetes directly from here, uh, from the interface. So we see the YAML that we were talking about earlier, right, about deploying this into a cluster. Uh, and this kind of takes away the headache of actually having to do that, because now we can specify our pod name, um, you know, create uh, services, um, to do any security context restriction. Uh, we can expose this service. Uh, so we'll do, uh, I think it's port 5001, right, uh, Stevan? Mm, yeah, probably. I don't remember this one. Believe I, be, I believe no. so. I believe so. No, mm. it's probably the other. Oops. Um, we'll give it a second. Well, we can redeploy it. Uh, but you'll see <laughs> uh, as this is going on, we've got the containers that are creating. Uh, so pretty familiar if you've you know uh, been working with Kubernetes, you know. Uh, the pods are, are pending here in a second, uh, but they're first pulling down the images uh, inside of this uh, Kubernetes cluster that we have here. Um, so we can see that we've got this pod, 
that is now being created. Um, you can see it's not ready just yet, but we give it a little bit of time once it pulls down the images uh, and we'll have that running locally, which is pretty neat. So we'll give it a second. And you can also see, you can manage all the pods here that have been created. So we'll go back here. Um, give it give it here just a, just a little bit of a second. Uh, and while this is happening, uh, I also want to kind of show the developer sandbox where we can take this this uh, this uh, kind of local environment. We can do all the testing on it here on Podman Desktop and actually deploy this to a cluster. So we could we could do that in a variety of different ways. We could take our pod, uh, and we could deploy it directly just from the Kubernetes context that we have here. Um, so if we have a remote cluster that we're already authenticated with, we could do that. And that's pretty neat. Um, but if you don't have a, a remote Kubernetes cluster that, you that you're that you working with, uh, we've got this completely free one that you can use called the Developer Sandbox. You probably, you know, DevNation family, you know, you've probably used it before. Um, and so I'll open up the link here. Uh, and this is just the shared Kubernetes OpenShift cluster uh, that, you know, is included with your, you know, Red Hat developer uh, membership, uh, completely free for 30 days. Um, and you can use this sandbox to do experimentation, uh, to test out things, to deploy your applications, because there's actually 14 gigabytes of RAM and there's 40 gigabytes of storage on this sandbox um, cluster that you can use. Uh, I'll use the default name for it here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to copy in the OC credentials. So I'll also set it as the default. Uh, and so here, once the web console opens, this is like any Kubernetes cluster, we're just going to copy in the OC login token or the, you know, uh, or sorry, any standard uh, OpenShift cluster. So I'll go here. Um, actually, I'll open this up a little bit. Copy login command, authenticate uh, with developer sandbox and use this token in order to connect Podman Desktop to my remote cluster that I have here. Um, so now if I go back to this pod that we have here, I could actually take it, uh, select this um, new developer sandbox context, uh, create the OpenShift routes as well, and create this pod. So you're going to notice here when we go back to the topology of my cluster um, that we have uh, in this project, now this new pod that's being created, right? That's containing both the Python application uh, and the containerized database. Uh, we can view the logs, um, see that Redis is starting. Uh, it's ready to accept connections. We'll give it a second. It looks like it's already running. Uh, we can also open up, um, oh, we'll give it a second to kind of finish uh, the, uh, the routing, uh, but we'll be able to access the, uh, the pod here or uh, from the ports here as well, so we'll give it a we'll give it a second to uh, to finish creating those routes. But but yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of the flow from going from local testing here with this kind cluster that we have, um, you know, to be able to do kubectl to get pods. Now this DevNation pod is running, um, and we can we can work with it from there to actually taking it to an external, uh, you know, remote Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, and, and working with it, adding, uh, you know, if we already have a database running into our cluster, uh, whether it's Redis, MongoDB, whatever it might be, connecting it from there um, and, and doing all the cool Kubernetes, um, you know, abilities that we have uh, on a cluster as well. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the quick flow that I have here. Um, there's also, also other really cool extensions that you can use, such as being able to, uh, for example, scan, um, my image, which takes a little bit of time, so maybe we'll come back to it. Uh, and Stevan, I think you had a little bit of a demo you wanted to share when working with Minikube. Um, so do you want to do that? I can uh, I can stop sharing. So yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Sounds good. I think we need someone to validate the screen sharing. I will, yeah, I'll let you know if I see it. I'm still waiting. Okay, cool. So similarly, this is Podman desktop, but this is a slightly newer version 
than the version that Cedric was uh, was running. Um, that's the one we are working on at, at the moment. So, uh, as uh, Cedric mentioned, you have the ability to uh, install different kind of extension within Podman Desktop, and here we have a, a new one uh, which is for uh, for Minikube. So, from the resource screen, you can then create a Minikube environment that you can uh, be running in a container directly from uh, from Podman uh, from Podman Desktop. And similarly to 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 Kind, you can access your cluster. You can get a terminal, and you can also run uh, directly kubectl uh, command from from there. Oh, actually not. So, but you are able to interact with your mini cube cluster directly from here and use it for uh, for development purposes. There is one. Other extension that I wanted to show you is um, uh, the extension for OpenShift local. So if you are targeting to deploy your application on OpenShift, you can actually spin up an OpenShift environment directly from uh, Podman Desktop and use it uh, within, uh, within uh, Podman uh, Desktop as well. You will see the different pods, you will see the different objects that you are deploying there uh, as well. And what is going to be very convenient is that if you are looking to deploy uh, an image onto your OpenShift environment, we are also going to have uh, an image checker, which is basically going to uh, test your, uh, your image and check if uh, the image is going to be compatible in terms of security for running Onto, uh, onto, uh, onto OpenShift. So here you can see that this image that is coming from, uh, from Docker Hub for Redis uh, is uh, having uh, one fairly bad trouble, which is the user is set to root. And if you really want to deploy your application onto production, you, you should probably not do that. So. This is what we are uh, what we are working on. Uh, those are some of the capabilities that you will be finding in future releases of uh, of Podman Desktop, which will really help you to uh, transition your containers and your application onto a Kubernetes production uh, environment. So um, maybe I should get back to the slides. Uh, is it okay for me? Yeah, if feel I free. Share? Okay, so uh, as a summary, oh, yeah, as a summary, uh, Podman Desktop is available for uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it will do the setup of Podman and all the different tools that you need in order to easily work uh, with uh, with Kubernetes. Um, we have support for OCI registries, as you saw in, during the demo. The support for pods. The way it is built is that uh, we have the virtualization stack, which on Windows relies on the WSL. On Mac, it is using QMU. Uh, and on Linux, it's running uh, natively, obviously. Um, and on top of that, the desktop client is a Node.js and Electron uh, application. And the UI framework that we are using is Tailwind and the Vault. So that's a... Uh, that's, uh, highly productive technologies uh, and pretty fun to work with. But what is interesting and important is that everything is extensible inside of the UI. So you can customize actions, menus, you can add tabs as I shown for, as I demoed for, uh, um, for uh, the, uh, the image checker. So all of this is free to be extended. Uh, and uh, actually, we already have few extensions for Kind, for Docker, for OpenShift Local, Minikube, and uh, and all of this. If you are targeting OpenShift, so you have the OpenShift uh, extension, uh, which allows you to to spin up an OpenShift environment locally, either uh, one which will be built with uh, MicroShift or another one with uh, with uh, OCP. But you also have the support for Dev Sandbox, and now we have this OpenShift image checker as well that allows you to to check the compliance uh, of your image against um, 
uh, his ability to run on uh, on OpenShift. So what's next, and how do we uh, how how to get start? So uh, on Podman, you can go to the Podman repository. It's uh, on GitHub, github.com uh, slash container slash Podman. Uh, right now, we are working on uh, improvements for the Podman machine to support the native hypervisors from uh, Apple, Windows. We are looking at faster uh, container startup as well. This is a, a strong requirement for um, edge devices and improving the support for uh, Kubernetes YAML uh, as well. On the uh, Podman desktop, uh, we are improving the, the onboarding experience so that it gets easier to configure your environment to run uh, and, and uh, run your environment uh, locally, get a Kubernetes environment uh, set up. We are also working on extending the, the support of Kubernetes objects in the UI. Today we have pods, but we are adding uh, deployment services and, uh, and ingresses. And we are still working on uh, improving the support of, uh, of OpenShift uh, as well. To get start, it's easy. On the web, you can go to podman.io or podman-desktop.io. On GitHub, it's easy as well. It's github.com slash containers and uh, slash podman. And we have uh, a lot of different chats uh, available in the community so that you can engage with us. We have Discord channels. We are also on Kubernetes. So you feel free to, to read, to, to join the, the community and to ask questions and, uh, and eventually to even contribute uh, by showing how you are using the tool as well. Um, OpenShift Sandbox, uh, the developer sandbox, as we have been using during uh, during the demo, uh, it's available for free. You will have a, a free account uh, to, to try out OpenShift. You will have uh, 14 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 40 gigabytes of storage. Uh, so you can really get deep inside of OpenShift and discover the technology uh, as well. And well, we're, we're really right up against the end here, and about at a time, we're going to have to <clears throat> probably wrap up the transition over. Um, I think uh, any any last words, uh, Cedric or Stefan? We've got about two minutes, or one minute actually. <laughs> well, yeah, real quick, um, St Stevan, there might be a good question for you from Kevin about uh, Kubernetes standalone version that runs on Windows, you know, like the desktop version of all the requirement software. Yeah, so that's podman-desktop.io to get the desktop version of all requirement software. I, I, I think. OK, so basically, uh, what you want to do is running pod locally. If you want to do that, there's two ways. Either you use Podman, and you can just do that straight with Podman, or you can spin up a, a, a Kubernetes environment that is going to run inside of containers locally within Podman. <laughs> and you can use that to also run pods uh, in those, uh, those environments. And that's the kind extension or the mini cube extension. But in fact, Podman Desktop allows you to set up those type of environment locally, easily, smoothly. And, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and yeah, it will run uh, on Windows in your virtualization uh, environment. Exactly. And All right, great. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for having yeah, us. Tonight. Appreciate both of you in the, the content today. A lot of good information. And Cedric had posted the, um, the links to the slides here in the in the chat. Um, I'm sure they're more than happy for you to follow up with them afterwards. These slides will be uh, uh, the the content will be available on the Red Hat Developer Channel in a handful of weeks, so you can go back and watch this and and watch the other sessions. Uh, we're going to stop the stream here real quick and switch over to our our last and final session of the day. And we appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having us. <laughs>